Welcome to Washington Today on C-SPAN Radio for Monday, January 17th, 2022. Democratic leaders in Washington using the Martin Luther King Jr. federal holiday to focus on voting rights bills in the Senate and an expected vote to change the filibuster rule to let those bills pass over solid Republican opposition. The late civil rights leader's son, Martin Luther King III, calling out by name the two Democratic senators who say they plan to vote no and whose votes would be necessary to get the change of the filibuster done. New Virginia Governor Glenn Youngkin, Republican, outlining his priorities to the General Assembly in Richmond and addressing his executive order giving parents the right to exempt their children from school system mask requirements. It's already gotten pushback from some schools in the state. And the World Economic Forum opens in Davos, Switzerland, virtual this year due to COVID-19. The United Nations Secretary General calling for reducing world inequality from vaccine access, climate change, debt forgiveness. And the Chinese president addressing the forum, warning the U.S. against a Cold War mentality. Members of the Reverend Martin Luther King Jr. family demanding Monday that the Senate scrap the filibuster and pass voting rights legislation as they led a D.C. march on the holiday honoring the civil rights icon. That's how the story from the Washington Post begins. It goes on, King's son, Martin Luther King III, his wife, Andrea Waters King, and 13-year-old daughter, Yolanda Renee King, joined several hundred other activists and residents in a frigid walk across the Frederick Douglass Memorial Bridge. The bridge, they said, symbolized President Biden and Congress's support for the recently approved $1.2 trillion infrastructure bill. The group continued as part of the Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Peace Walk on its two-mile route along Martin Luther King Avenue in Southeast. And then it was on to Union Station for a news conference, along with House Speaker Nancy Pelosi and other members of Congress. During that news conference, which was covered in its entirety by C-SPAN, Martin Luther King III explaining what was at stake King holiday this year. We're here to call on President Biden and the Senate to pass the Freedom to Vote John R. Lewis Act and to warn that our democracy stands on the brink of serious trouble without these bills. Last week, the president said he's tired of being quiet about voting rights. Well, we're tired of being patient. Since January 6, 2021, when the insurrectionists attacked our capital, 19 legislatures have passed 34 laws clawing back voting rights for their citizens. In states like my home state, where new laws, I should say of Georgia, are designed to confuse voters so they don't know where to go. They kick people off the voter rolls so they show up to vote and find out they're not registered. They close polling stations and limit voting hours so working parents and folks without access to transportation can't get there in time. These laws are being passed with knife-like precision to cut black and brown voters out of the process. And they're exactly what the Voting Rights Act wants protected against. That's just one state, but it's all over. Texas, Florida, Iowa, Arizona, the list goes on. More legislatures are gearing up to pass laws like these when they convene this year. And our Senate is letting them get away with it because of a little technicality called the filibuster. Martin Luther King III at a news conference in Washington. Changing the Senate filibuster rule by simple majority would mean that all 50 Senate Democratic caucus members would need to vote yes, since all 50 Republican senators are expected to vote no. And then the tie could be broken by Vice President Kamala Harris, a Democrat. And last week, two Senate Democrats said explicitly they will not support this. Martin Luther King III took them on today by name. We can eliminate the filibuster with a simple majority and then pass this bill that every Democratic senator says they support. But as you've heard, a few people stand in the way, not just Republicans, every one of them has taken an immoral position against voting rights. But that's not who I want to talk about today. I'm talking about two Democratic senators, 
Senator Joe Manchin and Senator Christian Sinema, who say they support the bill, but refuse to eliminate the filibuster to pass it. They think the real problem isn't that our rights are being stolen. They think the real problem is a disease of division that can be cured with some optimism in conversation. Now, my father worked to bring people together in his time, but he was no Pollyanna. In his speech, The Other America, he talked about how some people were pushing back on civil rights because like these two senators, they felt the problem couldn't be solved with legislation. They told him he had to change hearts first, and he worked hard at that. After all, he was a Baptist preacher. But he knew that when someone is denying you of your fundamental rights, conversation and optimism won't get you very far. He said, although it may be true that morality can't be legislated, behavior can be regulated, even though it might be true, he said, that the law cannot change the heart, it can restrain the heartless. Even though it may be true that the law cannot make a man love me, it can restrain him from lynching me. So let me be clear, when states are engaging in lawless voter suppression, only the law can stop them. Senator Sinema and Manchin also say, if, they be, if the bill doesn't get bipartisan support, it shouldn't pass. Well, the 14th Amendment, which granted citizenships to slaves in 1868, that didn't have bipartisan support. Should formerly enslaved people have been denied citizenship, Senator Sinema? The 15th Amendment that gave formerly enslaved people the right to vote in 1870, that didn't have bipartisan support. Should former slaves have been denied the right to vote, Senator Manchin? In 1922, 23, and 24, some senators filibusted an anti-lynching bill that had passed in the House. Would Senator Manchin and Senator Sinema have supported blocking those bills too? I'm just applying their logic here and showing that it's not logical at all. Martin Luther King III, son of the late Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. at a news conference today at Union Station, just a couple blocks away from the U.S. Capitol building. The Congress is out of session today for the King federal holiday. House and Senate both return to session on Tuesday at noon Eastern. The Senate will then debate the two voting rights bills that have passed the House, one setting national election standards, the other dealing with parts of the country with a history of discrimination, requiring them to get federal approval before changing any voting laws. And any rule change that happens is going to need the 51 votes. NBC News reporting that after the debate begins, Senate Majority Leader Chuck Schumer will eventually make a motion to end debate, which will set up a 60-vote threshold vote to move to a final vote. That's where Republicans are expected to execute a filibuster to block the legislation. Once that happens, Schumer has said the Senate will then consider rules changes, but he's not said which rules they will consider changing. Vice President Kamala Harris and President Joe Biden both speaking about this today during the during King Day events. Vice President in the Eisenhower Executive Office building joining virtually to the annual Beloved Community Service hosted by the King Center at the Ebenezer Baptist Church in Atlanta which Vice President and President visited last week to highlight the voting rights reform push. As has been said, as is known throughout the world, Dr. King was a prophet. He was a prophet in that he saw the present exactly as it was and the future as it could be. And he pushed our nation toward that future. Dr. King pushed even as his character was maligned. He pushed even as his family's life was threatened. He pushed even as his own life was in jeopardy. He pushed for racial justice, for economic justice, and for the freedom that unlocks all others, the freedom to vote. Today, our freedom to vote is under assault. In Georgia and across our nation, anti-voter laws are being passed that could make it more difficult for as many as 55 million Americans to vote 
55 million Americans. That is one out of six people in our country. And the proponents of these laws are not only putting in place obstacles to the ballot box, they are also working to interfere with our elections, to get the outcomes they want, and to discredit those they do not. That is not how democracies work. We know the threat we face. We know that this assault on our freedom to vote will be felt by every American in every community, in every political party. We know that if we stand idly by, our entire nation will pay the price for generations to come. Vice President Kamala Harris in Washington taking part virtually with the annual King Center service held at Ebenezer Baptist Church in Atlanta. That was the church where Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. was co-pastor from 1960 until his assassination in 1968. And the senior pastor currently is the one of the senators from Georgia, Democrat Raphael Warnock. Later in the day, Vice President Harris and Second Gentleman Doug Emhoff taking part in a service event at a local nonprofit in Washington. President Joe Biden making his King Day remarks to the annual policy breakfast held by the National Action Network, founded by Reverend Al Sharpton. This morning's event was virtual. President Biden had recorded his speech. Last week, Vice President Harris and I visited Atlanta, Georgia, the cradle of civil rights in America. We paused and prayed at the crypt of Dr. and Mrs. King. We met members of their family, Dr. Bernice King, Martin Luther King III, his wife, Andrea, his daughter, Yolanda. We met students who were changing the world, just like generations of young people before them had done that. In fact, Dr. King was just one of those young people, 15-year-old student at Morehouse College when he began his journey to fulfill the promise of America for all Americans, a promise that holds that we're all created equal and deserve to be treated equally throughout our lives. Dr. King wasn't just a dreamer of that promise, he was a doer. And on this federal holiday that honors him, it's not just enough to praise him. We must commit to his unfinished work, to deliver jobs and justice, to protect the sacred right to vote, the right from which all other rights flow. The attack on our democracy is real, from the January 6th insurrection to the onslaught of Republicans' anti-voting laws in a number of states. It's no longer just about who gets to vote. It's about who gets to count the vote and whether your vote counts at all. It's about two insidious things, voter suppression and election subversion. In his time, through his courage, his conviction, and his commitment, Dr. King held a mirror up to America and forced us to answer the question, where do we stand? Whose side are we on? We're in another moment right now where the mirror is being held up to America, being held up again. The question being asked again, where do we stand? Whose side are we on? Will we stand against voter suppression, yes or no? Will we stand against election subversion, yes or no? Will we stand up for an America where everyone is guaranteed the full protections and the full promise of this nation, yes or no? I know where I stand. And it's time for every elected official in America to make it clear where they stand. It's time for every American to stand up, speak out, be heard. Where do you stand? Whose side are you on? On this day of remembrance, service, and action, may God bless Dr. and Mrs. King and their family. And may God bless you all. And may God protect our troops. President Joe Biden recorded remarks to today's virtual National Action Network breakfast on the King holiday, part of a coordinated messaging campaign on voting rights and reforming the Senate filibuster on this Martin Luther King holiday. We've been mentioning that there are two bills the Senate will be taking up on Tuesday, votes possibly on Wednesday. Actually, they've been combined into one bill. They were passed last week by the House 
and the combination will make it easier for Democrats in the Senate to begin the debate procedurally. But, of course, ending debate or changing the Senate filibuster rules, as we've seen, is going to be tougher. All Senate Republicans oppose the first bill, the Freedom to Vote Act, which sets national election standards. And only one Senate Republican supports the second, the John Lewis Voting Rights Advancement Act, dealing with limiting states with history of discrimination from changing their voting laws. And that is Senator Lisa Murkowski of Alaska. Senator Marsha Blackburn, Republican of Tennessee, told Fox News this weekend why Republicans plan to vote no. They're trying to eliminate the filibuster to push forward their radical agenda, this socialist takeover. But they used the filibuster this week to block a vote on Ted Cruz's Nord Stream 2 sanction bill. So very hypocritical. But once again, they are going to try to do away with the filibuster to blow up the Senate so they can blow up the courts, so they can blow up our form of government. Manchin and Cinema have said in no way, shape, or form are they going to do that. So then they'll try to use yep. some legislative trickery to move forward their election takeover bill, which would institutionalize uh, vote uh, ballot harvesting, mail-in ballots. It would inst- it would get rid of voter ID and of signature match. They know that these radical policies are the only way that they can win. So they're willing to strip people of some of their rights, strip our states of their constitutional authority in order to get the power they want. Senator Marsha Blackburn on Sunday, on the Sunday Morning Futures with Maria Bartiromo program on Fox News Channel. Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen says the U.S. economy has never worked fairly for black Americans or really for any Americans of color. And she says the Biden administration has been working to change that. Yellen, in a pre-recorded message to the National Action Network King Holiday Breakfast, quoting lines from Dr. King's 1963 March on Washington speech on the steps of the Lincoln Memorial. Like many people, I use this holiday to reacquaint myself with that remarkable speech and was interested to see that Dr. King uses a financial metaphor in a key passage. Quote, when the architects of our republic wrote the magnificent words of the Constitution and the Declaration of Independence, unquote, he said they were signing a promissory note to which every American was to fall heir. It's obvious today that America has defaulted on this promissory note insofar as her citizens of color are concerned. He continued, they've been given a bad check, a check which has come back marked insufficient funds. But we refuse to believe the bank of justice is bankrupt. It's a compelling rhetoric. But I also think Dr. King knew it was more than a metaphor. He knew that economic injustice was bound up in the larger injustice he fought against. From Reconstruction to Jim Crow to the present day, our economy has never worked fairly for black Americans, or really for any American of color. Well, since taking office last January, our administration has tried to change that. The Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen to the National Action Network King Holiday Breakfast Some of the steps she says the administration has taken, including making sure equity was built into the COVID-19 economic relief law so the benefits would go to the communities of color, and $9 billion for community development financial institutions and minority depository institutions. This is Washington Today. Associated Press writes, with a video series on issues he sees as pertinent to the black community, the U.S. Senate's only black Republican, Tim Scott of South Carolina, is putting forth what he characterizes as a positive response to partisan rhetoric on race that he's best positioned to rebut. But that approach comes with some harsh words about President Biden's recent rhetoric. In conjunction with the Martin Luther King Jr. Day, Scott told the Associated Press that he hoped recent constituent roundtables on topics like building generational wealth would refocus a fraught national conversation on race. The current climate, Scott said, was only exacerbated by Biden's recent voting rights speech, which Scott called misleading. 
Scott said to compare or conflate people who oppose his positions as being racist and traitors to the country is not only insulting and infuriating, it's dead wrong. That reporting from the Associated Press. Well, Senator Tim Scott tweeted what he called a teaser video for the other videos. He's in a barber shop talking with other African-American men. There's this, there's this divide between do we give people stuff that they don't earn, or if you can earn it, if you can work, should you? And I think we should create a system where if you can work, you should. True, and, and giving people stuff is not creating generational wealth. And I see it all the time. You know, people are working, they're working, but they're just working. All the incentives that stops that from happening is hard on the employers, but it's also hard on the employee, the would-be employee, because the more incentives you have to stay home, the less likely, Anthony, you are to go to work, the harder it is to see yourself climb that economic ladder. They're not telling these people how you can create wealth. They're just telling these people how you can work. They just run in the circles. Yeah. Senator Tim Scott, Republican of South Carolina, and other men in a barber shop and a posted video. He called it a teaser video, part of a series of videos that he'll be creating. The Senate Republican leader Mitch McConnell tweeting today, nearly 60 years since the March on Washington, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr.'s message echoes as powerfully as it did that day. His legacy inspires us to celebrate and keep building upon the remarkable progress our great nation has made toward becoming a more perfect union. And the House Republican leader Kevin McCarthy with this tweet, from the halls of Ebenezer Baptist Church to the steps of the Lincoln Memorial, Martin Luther King spent his life spreading what he called the gospel of freedom. He never gave up and never preached hate. His words and example inspire us today as we celebrate a great American on Martin Luther King Day. A story at the BBC News. Two teenagers have been arrested in England as part of the investigation into a hostage-taking incident in a synagogue in Texas on Saturday. British citizen Malik Faisal Akram, 44, was shot dead after a standoff with police in Colleyville. Greater Manchester police said it was liaising with local communities and continuing to assist in the U.S. inquiry. In the House of Commons today in London, the British Home Secretary took a question on this. Mr. Speaker, following the events that have taken place in Texas this weekend, Mm. can the Home Secretary provide an update on the UK investigation into the British perpetrator of the attack on the congregation uh, Beth Israel Synagogue and the measures taken to ensure the security of the UK Jewish community? And can I further ask whether the perpetrator was known to security services? Uh, Mr. Mr. Speaker, first of all, I want to thank my honourable friend for his question. This is a very important matter. And just, just prior to questions this afternoon, Mr. Speaker, I had a bilateral call with my counterpart for Homeland Security in the US. And let me just say a few things. First of all, we are working with the FBI. In fact, we have been since the incident took place, and there's a great deal of intelligence sharing and work taking place on this. Of course, when it comes to our own domestic homeland, there are a range of measures that are being undertaken right now, including protective security for the Jewish community. And this is obviously a live investigation, so I'm unable to speak about this, um, talk about the specifics. Priti Patel is Home Secretary in Great Britain in the House of Commons today in London. Here in the U.S., President Joe Biden spoke to reporters about the attack. He spoke on Sunday while doing a King Day service event in Philadelphia. With regard to Texas and the synagogue, I spoke this morning with the attorney general and uh, to get a rundown on, he said there was overwhelming cooperation with the local authorities and the FBI, and, and uh, they did one hell of a job. This was an act of terror. This was an act of terror, and not only was uh, related to someone who had been arrested, I might add, 15 years ago and been in jail for 10 years. The idea is it was something new. Uh, And uh, they did just a great job. I also told him that I wanted to make sure we got the word out to synagogues and and places of worship that we're not going to tolerate this, that we have this capacity to deal with assaults on particularly the anti-Semitism that has grown up. And so, uh, and I'll be talking with, uh, I put a call into the rabbi, we missed one another on the way up here, and, uh, but they should rest assured that we are focused. We are focused, the Attorney General is focused on making sure that we deal with these kinds of acts. And uh, thank God, thank God, we have such a professional FBI, as well as uh, the local uh, cooperation, I was told, was incredible, it was seamless. So I just wanted to let you know that. 
That's President Joe Biden Sunday afternoon in Philadelphia. An FBI statement today says this is a terrorism-related matter in which the Jewish community was targeted and is being investigated by the Joint Terrorism Task Force. The statement from the FBI also saying the hostage taker spoke repeatedly about a convicted terrorist who was serving an 86-year-old prison sentence in the United States. That is believed to be uh, Afia Siddiqui serving a sentence in Fort Worth, Texas, after being found guilty of attempted murder and other charges and assault on U.S. officers in Afghanistan. Washington Today continues in a minute. This week on the Lectures in History podcast, the 18th century Enlightenment movement and the principles of natural rights, reason, and self-improvement. Messiah College professor John Fia explains. But you see this over and over again that the Enlightenment is both an individual effort, but the Enlightenment improvement, self-improvement always comes within some kind of community as well. So there's my first premise of the Enlightenment. The Enlightenment is about self-improvement. The Lectures in History podcast. Find it and follow wherever you get your podcasts. Welcome back to Washington Today, available as a podcast on the free C-SPAN Now mobile app and wherever you get your podcasts. Virginia's new governor, Republican Glenn Youngkin, giving his first address to a joint meeting of the General Assembly in Richmond. Youngkin was inaugurated on Saturday, after which he signed a series of executive orders, including one that gave parents the right to exempt their children from their school system's mask mandates. Some school systems have already said they will not comply, and the issue may be heading to the courts. Youngkin speaking about that executive order today. Schools exist for the educational benefit of children, and for that reason, they must remain open. I strongly encourage everyone to get the vaccine for COVID-19. And and please stay standing, because I strongly encourage you to get the booster as well. As we battle COVID, it's parents that should decide the health measures taken for their children. That's why I signed an executive order that allows parents to opt out of mask mandates in schools. This is a matter of individual liberty. Again, this body passed a law that protects parents' fundamental right to make decisions concerning the upbringing education, and care of their children. And healthcare workers should get to make those decisions too. I will continue to oppose President Biden's COVID vaccine mandate for health workers as we continue to fight a crisis of staffing across Virginia's health care system. Our fight against COVID-19 will move forward based on this simple principle. We will protect lives and livelihoods. As I said on Saturday, it simply means Virginia is open for business. Virginia Governor Glenn Youngkin, part of his first speech to the state senators and representatives, among those taking issue with his executive order dealing with making it optional for uh, kids in schools to wear a mask, the White House Press Secretary Jen Psaki, who tweeted this weekend, Arlington County parent here, thank you 
to the Arlington County School System for standing up for our kids, teachers, administrators, and their safety in the midst of a transmissible variant. From CNBC, White House Chief Medical Advisor Dr. Anthony Fauci said Monday it is still too soon to predict whether the Omicron COVID-19 variant will mark the final wave of the coronavirus pandemic. Fauci took part in a video conference panel at the World Economic Forum in Davos, Switzerland. The forum is online this year due to COVID-19 concerns. Is 2022 actually the year that we go from pandemic to endemic? And does Omicron speed up the process, given its ability to spread and offer immunity through infection? Well, the answer is we do not know that. And I think we have to be openly honest about that. And when the word endemic is used in different contexts, when I talk about the pandemic, I put it into five phases, the truly pandemic phase where the whole world is really very negatively impacted as we are right now. Then there's the deceleration of the pandemic. Then there's control. Then there's elimination and eradication. I think if you look at the history of infectious diseases, we've only eradicated one infectious disease in man, and that's smallpox. That's not going to happen with this virus. Then there's elimination. Elimination means when you get rid of it in your own country, but it's somewhere not in your country, but it's there. For example, polio has been eliminated in the United States and many developing nations. So what's the next one up the ladder is control. Control means you have it present, but it is present at a level that does not disrupt society. And I think that's what most people feel when they talk about endemicity, where it is integrated into the broad range of infectious diseases that we experience. For example, the cold weather upper respiratory infections, the parainfluenzas, the respiratory syncytial viruses, the rhinovirus, the adenoviruses. You want to get it at a level that doesn't disrupt society. That's the answer to your first question. That's my definition of what endemicity would mean, a non-disruptive presence without elimination. When you talk about whether or not Omicron, because it's a highly transmissible but apparently not as pathogenic, for example, as Delta. I would hope that that's the case, but that would only be the case if we don't get another variant that eludes the immune response to the prior variant. For example, we were fortunate that Omicron, although it is highly transmissible, nonetheless is not as pathogenic, but the sheer volume of people who are getting infected overrides that rather less level of pathogenicity. So I really do think, uh, Francine, that it is an open question as to whether or not Omicron is going to be the live virus vaccination that everyone is hoping for, because you have such a great deal of variability with new variants emerging. Dr. Anthony Fauci is director of the National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Diseases in the United States at a Davos Agenda panel at the annual World Economic Forum. CNN reporting today that early data out of Israel suggests that a fourth dose of either the Pfizer, BioNTech, or Moderna coronavirus vaccine can bring an increase in antibodies more than what's been seen after a third dose, but it still might not be enough to protect against breakthrough infections caused by the Omicron variant. Also speaking to the World Economic Forum as it opened today, the United Nations Secretary General Antonio Guterres, who, Reuters reports, appealed to business leaders on Monday to support developing countries in their hour of need with access to COVID-19 vaccines, help to combat the climate crisis and reform of the global financial system. This year's World Economic Forum takes place in the shadow of an enormously difficult period for economies, for people, and for the planet. According to the UN's economic report released last week, the world is emerging from the depths of a paralyzing economic crisis, but recovery remains fragile and uneven amid the lingering pandemic, persistent labor market challenges, ongoing supply chain disruptions, rising inflation, and looming debt traps not to mention the geopolitical divide. And as a result, we see recovery slowing down quite substantially. And all of this threatens hard-won progress in advancing the 2030 agenda 
and the Sustainable Development Goals, our key projects. The last two years have demonstrated a simple but brutal truth. If we leave anyone behind, in the end, we leave everyone behind. If we fail to vaccinate every person, we give rise to new variants that spread across borders and bring daily life and economies to a grinding halt. And if we fail to provide debt relief and financing to developing countries, we create a lopsided recovery that can send an interconnected global economy into a tailspin. If we fail to reduce inequalities, we weigh down economic progress for all people in all countries. And if we fail to match climate rhetoric with climate actions, we condemn ourselves to a hotter, more volatile hearse with worsening disasters and mass displacement. Now, at the core of these failures is a global inability to support developing countries in their hour of need, and also a problem of governance for international different systems. United Nations Secretary General Antonio Guterres, he said that the, of the World Health Organization's targets of getting 40 percent of people in all countries vaccinated against COVID-19 by the end of 2021 and 70 percent by the middle of 2022, we are nowhere near those goals. Another speaker at the World Economic Forum, Chinese President Xi Jinping, who called on other world powers to discard what he calls a Cold War mentality at a time of rising geopolitical tensions. Associated Press writes that it was a veiled swipe at the United States. You will hear the voice of the interpreter. We need to discard Cold War mentality and seek peaceful coexistence and win-win outcomes. Our world today is far from being tranquil. Rhetorics that stoke hatred and prejudice abound. Acts of containment, suppression, or confrontation arising thereof do all harm not the least good to world peace and security. History has proved time and again the confrontation does not solve problems. It only invites catastrophic consequences. Protectionism and unilateralism can protect no one. They ultimately hurt the interests of others as well as one's own. Even worse are the practices of hegemony and bullying, which run counter to the tide of history. Naturally, countries have divergences and disagreements between them. Yet a zero-sum approach that enlarges one's own gain at the expense of others will not help. Acts of single-mindedly building exclusive yards with high walls or parallel systems of enthusiastically putting together exclusive small circles or blocks that polarize the world, of overstretching the concept of national security to hold back economic and technological advances of other countries, and of fanning ideological antagonism and politicizing or weaponizing economic, scientific and technological issues will gravely undercut international efforts to tackle common challenges. The interpreter for the Chinese President Xi Jinping as the president gave a virtual speech to the World Economic Forum in Davos, Switzerland. Associated Press writes that Russia's top diplomat angrily rejected the U.S. allegations that it was preparing a pretext to invade Ukraine as Russian troops that are amassed near the Ukraine border launched more drills Monday. The White House said Friday that U.S. intelligence officials had concluded that Russia had already deployed operatives to rebel-controlled eastern Ukraine to carry out acts of sabotage there and blame them on Ukraine in a false flag operation to create a pretext for possible invasion. Speaking to reporters Monday, the Russian Foreign Minister Sergei Lavrov dismissed the U.S. claim as total disinformation. And finally, on Washington Today, remembering former Tuskegee Airman Charles McGee, who has passed away at the age of 102. The Tuskegee Airmen were African-American military pilots serving in the segregated Army Air Corps during World War II. McGee stayed in the Air Force, became the Air Force, through the Korean and Vietnam Wars flying more than 400 missions over a 30-year career, retiring as Brigadier General. Two years ago, in 2020, he was on C-SPAN's American History TV, talked about, about how the success of the black 
Air Force mechanics during World War II paved the way for the pilots. Part of that Army policy, although there were blacks getting their early flight training in the civilian pilot training program, um, in fact, I believe it was in Washington, D.C., one of the graduates from the CPT uh, um, went to her and said, I want to be an Army pilot, and said, oh, we can't use black pilot because we don't have any black mechanics. So of the now called Tuskegee Airmen, I would say the first were the mechanics, and it was because of their training that I even learned about about the program. I was at, uh, enrolled at the University of Illinois in the engineering program, but uh, the but mechanics were entered into training at the tech school, Chanute Field, Rantoul, Illinois. That's 14 miles away from the university, and of course we learned something's going on because they got blacks in training up there. They were expected to fail. In fact, they were even tested twice because the first didn't believe that, that they could get scores like they did in, in, their, in the te test program. They were successful and then the Army said, wow, we need an Air Force for the pilot training. Air Forces, I mean, bases all around the country. They found $4 million to build Tuskegee Army Airfield for the training. So the, of the now called Tuskegee Airmen, the first were really the mechanics. They were successful. A few months uh, after the, the field became available, the uh, pilot training began. And although the 99th, their pilots and their mechanics were trained and, and ready for combat. No white commander wanted them. Charles McGee at a program in 2020 hosted by the Friends of the National World War II Memorial. Defense Secretary Lloyd Austin, the first African-American to hold that post, tweeting on Sunday, Today we lost an American hero, Charles McGee, Brigadier General and one of the last surviving Tuskegee Airmen, passed away at the age of 102 while I'm saddened by his loss, I'm also incredibly grateful for his sacrifice, his legacy, and his character. Rest in peace, General. A tweet from Defense Secretary Lloyd Austin. Thanks for listening to Washington Today. And for more top Washington stories, subscribe to C-SPAN's evening newsletter word for word at c-span.org forward slash connect. Have a good night. 